Hello everybody. I'm going to speak loud because I think you're all suitably asleep by now. It's very warm in here. So, my name's Simon Buckley. I'm going to talk to you about automated database migrations. Um, it's a bit of a dry topic, so I'll do my best to keep it entertaining and move around and wiggle my arms and just try and keep you awake because it's the end of the day. Start off with a little bit of audience participation. I realise a lot of people have connected here today, but how many people here work on a project that has a continuous stream of database changes? Have a show of hands. Anybody? There's one there in the back. Or in the past. Just a quick poll, how many use an, or use an open source automated tool to manage those? Anybody? No? Stop me when you see something that you, you did yourself. Yeah, I did. Automated tools, yeah, I remember that from last month. I saw your, your, your schema change code. This is by far the most common, right? SQL files, pass them about between environments. And then, a lot more common than I expected. Uh, just changing my hand in the database, just go on to production, make the change, done. I am not a big fan of just changing it in production. There are rules for hassle free database development. So, my philosophy, and it's uh, also a philosophy that a lot of people are the also subscribe to, each developer should have their own database instance that they can work from, um, that they're free to mess up, change, do everything to. Uh, there shouldn't be really shared database servers uh, because usually what happens, somebody's working on a feature branch, makes a load of schema changes, then somebody else comes to work on the same development server and they can't work. Waste of time, um, just burns through development hours, and it's got a simple solution to have your own database. This is another important one. There should be one authoritative source of truth for your database. It's typically production, uh, but you might go as far as to have a reference database. Um, but let's face it, it's going to be production. Um, and then in my opinion, database changes should be code reviewed, source controlled and versioned, and it's the versioning part that this talk is going to concentrate on, mainly with a tool called Flyway. So this is your typical development environment. Each developer has a copy of their code on their machine, and if they're adhering to the rules, they'll have an instance of a database, and then they'll have environments, if they're lucky, they'll have continuous integration, uh, they'll have a test environment and production. But typically when it comes to data race changes, what happens is you get questions like what state, what is the state of the database in test? When was the last time anybody did something to this environment? Is there actually any usable data? Those sorts of questions. Has this really important script for this feature we want to show one of our clients? Has that been applied? Do we know? And that really important production <coughs> hotfix we did last week, did we backport it to any environment? So if you come across these problems, what usually happens is you sit on the various databases, you go line by line for the scripts you have and see, mm, that table looks the same, that table looks the same. And it, again, burns through a lot of developer hours. No, there's a better way. And just database cap, likes to make changes. <laughs> Looks so innocent. So there's two major tools out there. There's Flyway and Liquibase. They largely do the same thing. They just have very diff well, different philosophies in the way that they approach it. Um, if you've used Ruby on Rails, there's also things, uh, Active Record Rock Migration, that does a very similar thing. Uh, if you've used Play Framework, they've got something called Evolution, very similar to Flyway. There's a lot of tools, essentially, uh, and they all enable you to create portable databases or skeleton databases, allow you to see which changes have been applied. Remember that asterisk, I'm going to come back to that later. 
and help you to migrate your current database version to a different database version. So you've got changes you want to apply, um, so you and, then, and apply them. So Flyway DB uses a really basically keep it simple approach. It uses <coughs> essentially puts a schema version table into each environment uh, in your database, and then you just put SQL files in a particular location. Um, that's basically the essence of it. You can have SQL based file migrations or Java migrations and it integrates with every build tool I can think of or come across um, and it's all under an open source license. So I was mentioning every build tool, um, there's the command line, the Java API, Maven, Gradle and SPT, they all have three things in common things that Flyway needs to work in addition to your migration files are a database URL, a user and a password. And that's the, 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 the sort of the basics of what it needs. Here is an example I've lifted from where I've set it up for uh, a project that was using Oracle in the past. Um, so essentially it's just defining the plugin, the URL which we made environment dependent via Maven profiles, the user which we extracted to environment variables so we didn't have the credentials in our source control and then there's a couple of other things that we changed. Um, in this particular example I wanted the uh, the default for Flyway is to have a version table called schema version and in this particular project the list of tables was huge and I wanted just to have the schema version table right at the end so I could always find it easily to check the status of the database. Uh, there's a couple of other options there which we'll try and cover if there's time but essentially it's a very simple setup and configuration. Um, so most of using Flyway revolves around a number of goals or commands and these are common across the build tools that you you, you would use it with um, it just the, on things such as Gradle you'd prepend Flyway uh, to the goal um, but essentially the, the core concepts are the same so the obvious one migrate looks at your current um, database environment, looks at the schema version table, checks the migrations to be applied and just goes ahead and, and applies them. Clean, drops all the objects in the schema. So not one that you want to run on production, as you can probably understand. Info is when you come to a environment that you've you don't know the state of the migrations and you want to see a printout <coughs> of the migrations that have been applied and the migrations that are remaining to be applied. Validate, I'll cover this a little bit further in a minute but essentially just checks the state of the migrations, the content of the migrations against the version table. Baseline, this is for when you're creating, uh, well, when you're introducing Flyway to the project and you want to specify your starting schema. So it's the file that contains all of the, all of the t database creation, indexes, constraints, all of that sort of thing. And repair, if by any chance the, the version table that Flyway uses gets damaged this will, that will initiate a repair. So I've covered those very quickly, but I'll go into a bit more detail. So I mentioned that Flyway essentially uses 
SQL files, for want of a better word. Um, the idea being you put each change that you want to make to the database into uh, a SQL file. Now, Flyway specifies the use of a versioning system for those files such that it knows how to apply the migration to the database and in which order. Um, so this is the simplistic <coughs> one that they list on their website. Essentially, you just name a file with V at the beginning as your prefix. You give it a version number, in this case two. There's a separator, a description, and then it's a SQL file, so it's going to end in .sql. Um, we'll cover repeatable migrations um, in a second. For your own projects and for simple things that you're playing about with, this versioning scheme is perfectly fine. I tend to find that for larger projects where you've got multiple developers writing migrations, a, a slightly more verbose naming scheme is preferred and it's typically, I mean, so in this instance, We've still got the prefix, but the version number we've changed to reverse timestamp. We've introduced the Jira ticket number so somebody knows what the migration refers to if they were unfamiliar with it before. The author, so you know who to blame if, if they've written some, some code that deletes half the database. And then I found it quite helpful just to list whether you're changing data or altering the structure of the database with a little uh, prefix on the end. By convention, they go into DB migrations. You can change that, it's configurable. Um, but the, the basis of it is, you write SQL in these files, you pull it into your DB migrations folder, and then you run flyby migrate. Um, you can also go crazy with your versioning schemes. Flyway will accept it. Um, if you wanted to tie it to your application release number, you could do so. Um, my tip though would be to always keep a format that easily sorts when you're looking at it in a file explorer because then you can follow the chronological thread. So this is an example of a schema version table. It's really, really simple. Um, <coughs> there's not a lot, that, can everybody see that by the way? So. The script just lists the file name and location of the file that's to be applied, and then it splits it out into its version and description. Um, the installed rank is there because you can have the option of installing migrations out of order if you wish, so that just records the order if they were installed out of order. And the really important one, or the takeaway, is Flyway will run a checksum of your files and their contents to ensure that once it's applied a migration to your database, if anybody changes the migration, you know about it. So you can take action or, or you know there's an inconsistency. Um, execution time is quite useful to have. If you've got a migration that takes 20 minutes because you're changing a million rows in a database, um, it would record the execution time and on the assumption you're testing with a copy of production data you know then when it comes to deployment that you need however long the migrations took to execute to do your deployment so when your 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 PM or somebody asks you oh, how long is this deployment going to take half an hour you can say no we need an hour or so and uh, not upsetting and finally the success column. So the success column records whether a migration was successful, for want of a better word. Um, so occasionally, if, if you if a failed migration appears, there'll obviously be a zero in there. You could do Java-based migrations. Um, so this is basically based on the Spring JDBC template you can write SQL. This is kind of imagined where you want to do complex data changes that you, you could easily express in code. I've not had an occasion to use these, um, 
because I'm comfortable with SQL to do even quite co co complex changes. But the options there. Is that an either or kind of thing? Can you mix and match SQL? Yes. Yeah. You can absolutely. So you can you can have a list of SQL migrations, then a Java migration, and then carry on with a list of SQL migrations. Repeatable migrations, this is something relatively recent. They've only introduced this in the past month or so. Um, and I'm glad they've introduced this because you get quite, if you've got a database view which is subject to a lot of change during the course of development, you essentially find yourself writing the same migration but with one column difference. Um, and then you end up with a lot of noise in your migrations just to re replace the view each and every time. So they've introduced this and it doesn't have a version number. All it does is when you run Flyaway and Migrate, it detects if the contents have changed and then reruns it. So really useful feature to have. So live demo time. I've constructed a cr sort of crude copy of Meetup. Um, I got sort of sidetracked when I was preparing this talk because I came across something called JHipster. If you take away nothing else from this talk because you're not interested in databases, go home and check out JHipster because it's a combination of Spring Boot, Angular, Yeoman, and just the speed you can create a web app with is absolutely frightening. Um, they're going to be doing a talk at DevOx uh, in June on this, uh, but there's already talks on there on YouTube for it. Ironically, JHipster uses Liquibase out of the box. So what I've done is built my app, ripped out Liquibase, and put in Flyway in its place. So we can have a little look at that. I'm just going to sit down. Here we have a Spring Boot project. Um, interesting features. Uh, is our initial migration. So, effectively, the the tables we're interested in are the get together table, the join table, get together attendees, talk speaker. And this is all just plain SQL. I've got a completely empty schema. So with a little bit of luck, what should happen is I should start up my app. Um, the one thing that I've forgotten to mention is that the integration with Spring Boot is literally three lines of code to add Flyway to a Spring Boot project. And just find it, not that one. So, if you add that dependency to a Spring Boot project, it will get picked up. Um, my migrations are in a DB migration folder. So, is Spring Boot doing anything extra with that dependency, or is it? Um, could you just use that in a normal Spring Boot, standard Spring Okay. Uh, so for a standard Spring application, you would come down here and define uh, the plugin. Yeah. So like the on the slide where I had that format of an example, um, this is basically the same manual configuration that you would use outside of a Spring Boot app. Um, the Spring Boot auto configuration picks up my data source and just um, because it's got an application. YML 
it knows uh, the data source and passwords to use. it's not running, make sure my schema is in fact empty. Just run the app. Okay, I'm just going to check that so I could see Flyway running just there. And it's there's the action where it's actually creating or migrating the schema to version one. So I'll just prove that there. So it's created my database tables for me. As per the script to go and view the app. What we've got here is just a simple app that listed the main model that we had in that slide. I can create a get together. Um, got no locations but it will still let me do it. Um, I could add talks. We're going with the Hello World theme today, and there's a talk successfully um, linked to that get together. So, because we're short, short on time, I'm just going to show you all of the migrations that I've written for this. Um, the idea being, we really want some data in our database, so I've added some locations, some get-togethers, and some talks. Oh, and the one thing I haven't shown you, the schema version table. So at the moment, because it's just our initial migration, We've only got one entry in here, but it's picked up the execution time and the checksum. Bear with me one moment. So for Spring Boot, um, because it does a lot of auto configuration, um, some of the actions are easier just to tap in through a flyway migration strategy as opposed to having to enable the plugin. Um, so basically, I'm just going to do a clean, clear down the database and then add in my, my data. So hopefully now we should have some get-togethers and we've got locations. I've deliberately omitted the talks. It's cleaned down the database so the hello world entry we put in has gone. Um, but what I want to show you is a failure mode. What happens when it actually fails and what we would do about it. So I've got this migration I made earlier. And what I'm going to do is just remove one of the IDs. Obviously all the IDs are kind of hard coded in this contrived example. In another slide I'm going to tell you not to do this, but hopefully you'll forgive me. 
So I'm expecting to run this app and it will take out the clean from there. <coughs> So it should fail when it comes to apply the last migration. Yeah, we've got a nice big error message. It's scrolled up. It tells me the column count doesn't match. So then in the schema version table, if I refresh that, I can see that this last um, this last migration is a failure and at this stage I have to take manual um, intervention. Uh, Flyway wor works on the basis of a one transaction per migration but fortunately because there's no commits in there there's the talks is an empty table so to get back to a state where I'm where I can migrate again I fix my migration pull a repair into my strategy what should happen fingers crossed is it repairs the schema version table and applies the migration and when that happens I should have some talks in my database So that was a very quick live demo. <coughs> so I mentioned the asterisk earlier. Should I make changes to the DB outside of Flyway? Anyone guess what the answer is? Go for no. No. <laughs> Good answer. Um, essentially, this is kind of where most of these tools hit a stumbling block. If you're going to use them, you need everybody to buy into them. If you've got resistance, you need to kind of convince and cajole. Um, the DBA will go, well, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to use an automated tool. That steps on my toes. That's that's my job function. Um, the other one that I come across is if you've got a, a boss that likes to fiddle with a production database you've then got to find some way of getting that information back into Flyway to update all your other environments and that requires discipline because even something as simple as an index that's already been added, added could trip over the migration um, and this is the difficult part this you know the technique the, the technology is fairly easy um, and I've worked had been through this experience recently uh, the only thing you can do is just demonstrate the technology as much as possible and test it and test it until everybody's convinced that it works mm. and it's efficient and it saves time. Um, there are a couple of gotchas. I'll run through them very quickly. Does anybody know what, I, when I say implicit commits, does that ring bells with, it, with everybody? So there are some database um, systems whereby this alter table statement will automatically commit the transaction. Um, if I was to run this in the contents of a migration, so I've got some insert values, an alter, and then the idea is this, this is a SQL statement that's not correct, uh, it's gonna fail. If I was to write this in a migration, what I would find is my table would have the new column name, um, and I'd come to run this migration again, and I'd have um, twice as many values as I was expecting and then the migration would fail because the columns already been added. There are some ways around that. You could make your migrations bear with me, identipotent so that you check for the the presence of the change before you try and attempt to do the change. <coughs> this is a bit of a trade-off because it makes the SQL more difficult to read, more difficult to code review and if you're testing your migrations up front, it shouldn't really be necessary because you, you will have tested them and as long as you're not 
making manual changes to the database, you know, you, you move the migrations through the environments as they're tested and you shouldn't come across any unexpected results. Um, I mentioned my examples uh, were, had hard-coded IDs. Obviously, you can't expect foreign keys to be the same between environments, so you should write your SQL in such a way that it selects the correct ID based on the criteria you're looking for. A silly one when I was doing this example is I hard-coded the database name and then tried to try to change the database name and found my migration this wouldn't work. Uh, a really important one is never do a clean in production, obviously. Otherwise you'd be like this fella. Um, <laughs> it's surprisingly easy to do if if you are in the wrong terminal window. Fortunately I haven't done it yet. Um, another kind of important feature <coughs> is if you've got a 500 line SQL migration, you really need to be splitting that up into smaller files, simply because if a migration fails, and it fails halfway through, you've then either got to unpick if they, if, if, you know, if, if there was a commit in there, or the changes before it, or simply you've just got to find where it failed. Um, so if you split them up into smaller migrations, you'll have a lot easier time of that because the version table will tell you which migrations failed. You go to that migration, it's small, you make the fix and you carry on. Um, out of order migrations I've kind of touched upon before. That's, um, you could you can turn it on so that uh, Flyaway will, will do that for you. Um, the alternative is when you merge your feature branch into master, just to rename the migration, that you might find that clearer and easier to use. Um, and then when using build tools, the migrations are run from the target directory, so you might change the source, run flyway, and expect your migration to happen. You need to put a compile or whatever Maven goal or build tool goal copies your migrations into the target directory. So mentioned liquid base as well. Um, philosophy difference. You'll, you'll understand that in a minute. Baromir is talking about. SQL queries. So Liquibase uses a structured DSL to describe changes. Um, so if you were going to try and introduce that, you might find even more resistance to Flyway, which is why I'm giving a talk on Flyway and not Liquibase. Um, the DSL was initially XML based. There's a lot of XML hate out there, uh, just simply because it's been used for a lot of things that perhaps shouldn't have been but now we've got <coughs> options for JSON or even annotated SQL. Um, because Liquibase puts its changes uh, into a DSL, you can come across the situation whereby a change you could do in database specific SQL isn't possible in the DSL. Uh, and when that happens, you have to fall back to native SQL anyway. So. If you're comparing the tools, what I'd suggest is look at the type of migrations you're doing and see whether they can be expressed in Liquibase's domain-specific language, and that will tell you, will give you a feeling for which one to use. It has some positive points, though. Um, Flyway kind of allows you to write database-specific migrations, so you're always locked in, effectively, unless you're going to rewrite the migrations. Um, Liquibase will do rollbacks for simple statements. Um, I don't know which ones at the top of my head, but and where it doesn't do automatic rollback for you, it allows you to write your own. There's a database diff tool, so you can compare databases between environments. Generate SQL files so that you can send it off to your DBA for review. Documentation, and I've already mentioned fallback to native SQL. And that's it. Is anybody interested in viewing the Liquibase XML for kind of comparison? No? Okay. <laughs> I think that answers my question. Any questions? So uh, you mentioned the 2 a.m. boss thing. Yeah. What if your boss then gets on a flight to the holiday for three weeks? Is there any sort of tools or tricks you can use just to make sure that you're going to start writing to a, a prepared? 
it's difficult because once they've made the commit the change to the database obviously this is probably somewhere where liquid base probably edges it out because you could actually do a compare using their diff tool to find the changes um, other than that you'd have to take check database logs to see which statements were run and then sort of backport and migration from that uh, point onwards um, but really this is where you really need to get the stakeholder involvement you need to un make everybody understand that the only way we change the database is through migrations if you want to do a 2am fix just write a quick migration for it nine times out of ten they're not going to just go altering column do production you know they they're actually going to write some SQL for it, I hope. And if they're not, then perhaps you should get somebody brave to have a word and say, "Can you not do that, please?" Um, but yeah, that's you know, it's a difficult, it's a, it's, it's a people problem, not necessarily a technology problem. So. Anything else? I think it kind of goes on from that question. What's the before? It's a migration just only file, and when you do a commit. Can see something else change there straight away. So, oh, I also change that. You push. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people aren't going to pull, rebuild, or more like migration conflicts. They're just going to push, and then you're going to have to fix it later. Yeah. You get that a lot. Yeah, you can do. I mean, <laughs> it depends if you're using pull requests as well, because typically, if you're doing a pull Typically what happens then is it's only your database that's out of sync and if you've got a skeleton database you just rebuild it. If you haven't got a skeleton database, if you can put your database into a virtual machine, snapshot <coughs> it and then roll it back to a known good state and then run the migrations again, you can sort of get around it that way. Um, but that kind of comes back to the rules of each developer needs control over their database environment with their own instance. and keep them as short as possible so that if there is kind of um, ambiguity that it's only limited to a, a small scope in terms of SQL. So uh, setting up your database to ensure that the actual environment is consistent, you're then looking at automated build scripts for database configuration and development machines to make sure you've got a stable platform across the presumably. Yeah. Um, so, 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 just, so are you talking about what, how would you actually, um, so for instance, you could use something like Vagrant if you wanted to build, you know, database VMs. Ansible Chef. Yeah, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then you just effectively run your normal build chain and it does the migrations for you. Um, you you'd obviously have environment profiles so that the right uh, credentials are for each environment. Uh, but that th that's kind of a good point. This is where it really comes into its own. If there's only two of you uh, on a project, then perhaps you can get away with just changing all the SQL by hand. When it's in production and there's ten developers all working on features, that's where you really you really need this, in my opinion. You know, you you, you just you waste so much time fiddling about with the database when actually you want to be writing code and writing features. Oh, one question. Uh, for the configuration, there is internal table used, version table. Yeah. Okay. So that table is present in the same application database? Uh, the table? Yeah. It is present in the same database or there is a different database configured for this? Uh, so that version table gets yeah. added into every database you run the tool on. Okay, so I have two databases. Uh -huh. So that I want to uh, monitor. So it will present in both. Uh, so the basic is that if there is a worst case scenario, uh -huh. that the database will crash. Uh -huh. So will I lose all that data? So there's, if the database server crashes, the idea is you restore the version table from your backups that you make of your database. You, you wouldn't, that's kind of where the scope of the tool ends. Um, it's only from managing the migrations and deployment of the migrations really. So one last one. Um, I know a few DBAs and what they do is say, look, you can't have this because your Spring Boot configuration is determining the code and you do one sloppy bit of code and it's your Bobby Tables comes along. 
little bit of SQL injection and the same use we've got rights to the like database. Um, I presume you can use your logger configuration. Yeah, so if I can show you, if we've still got, is everybody all right to hang on just for a minute? Maybe after, I don't know, but uh, whoops. I've lost my cursor, there we go. <laughs> so, one of the things that, uh, so I was showing this plugin, so if I just do that, hopefully the artifact is still there, so what I should be able to do is go, Hopefully that should just tell me the state of the database. A bit of luck. So there we go. So if you wanted to disable the Spring Boot automatic uh, kind of uh, the, word, the the integration, you could do so and just use the Maven plugin and then do all of your migrations manually using just these commands like migrate, validate, etc. So you don't have to use the, the stuff that's... Um, I was a bit surprised when I came to use the, um, Spring Boot with Maven and Flyway because I'd only used that combination before with Gradle. And Gradle allows you to run... Um, I don't think you actually need the plugin to, to run the goals, but I'll, I'll check that. But um, I was surprised I had to run in the plugin for, for Maven. 